Good morning. Good morning, and happy Easter. happy Easter. I'm humbled by your presence here this morning here in worship, or if you're here in the sanctuary, thank you for being here, or if you're joining us online. Again, I am humbled and honored by your presence here this morning. My name's Reverend Bernie Hinckley, and it's just good for all of us to be here this morning to come and to worship. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements, especially for those of you who are joining us online. We will be celebrating communion during uh, the worship service, so please use uh, a cinnamon roll, maybe leftover food from last night, whatever you have to make communion worthy, uh, helpful for you. Uh, let me see. After the service, um, we have bake sale items out in this side entrance here, uh, so please... Uh, Grab some last minute goodies so when you're going to your Easter lunch, brunch, or supper that you have something to bring and that would be great if you could help us out by buying some of those things. So thank you for that. To thank everyone who worked hard yesterday for the Easter egg hunt and bake sale. Uh, looked like it was a great turnout from the community for that so thank you to everyone for that. Let me see, what else do I have? Oh, now as we come into worship, just take a moment to observe and to notice who you're worshiping with this morning. And perhaps just give a quick greeting to know that we never enter as strangers, but always as children of God. So. All right. And Continue those greetings of warmth and welcome during and after the worship service to make sure that we know who we're worshiping with and that we can see the presence of God in each other this morning. If you come here this morning for the first time, know that you are welcomed here. If you come here many times before, as always, you are welcome here. If you stayed up late watching NCAA basketball, you are welcomed here. If you come with wonders, questions, doubts, enthusiasms, you are welcomed here. If you come here believing a lot, a little, or not at all, you are welcomed here. For as our denomination, the United Church of Christ says, no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcomed here. And now let us join together in the responsive call to worship as it is printed in the bulletin. The tomb is dark, but empty. The one you are looking for has overcome the darkness. The stone has been rolled away. The one you are looking for has overcome death. The burial cloths are put aside. The one you are looking for is alive, for Christ is risen Christ is risen indeed.
Please be seated. And now let us join saying together the opening prayer as it is printed. Resurrecting God, guide us in telling and sharing the story of your endless love through our words and deeds. Remind us of your presence. Fill our hearts with your ways of love that bring about peace and justice for all. With your loving embrace, protect us in the face of terror and hateful actions. Bring us your hope found in the excitement of eternal life and saving love, exemplified in Jesus, the risen Christ. Amen. And then there are two gospel lessons today. The first is perhaps one of my favorites. It's the story of the walk to Emmaus that in Luke's version, the third book of the New Testament, the third gospel to have been written, that the resurrection had happened, but the disciples had questions and still needed to get stuff together, to figure some stuff out. And perhaps like some of us, they get away from the scene to go somewhere else to clear their heads. But on their journey, they are joined by someone. But let us listen to the story and hear the moment when they realize who has joined them on this journey. Now, on that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you talking about with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And Jesus asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem all of Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us, for they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to the two disciples, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead of them, as if he were going on his journey. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. May the Lord's blessings be added to our hearing and understanding of these words for our day. At this time, I'd like to invite the young children among us to join me up front for the word for all ages.
wanted Chuck instead of the toy. No? Oh, all right. Just, just, just checking it out. All right.
want to come now to invite people and to thank you all, first of all, so for supporting the ongoing ministries here at TCC with your time, your talent, and your treasure. And this morning, as we have an opportunity to give back to God, the offering plates will be passed around. Do realize that many of you also give online, uh, but if you're here this morning and would like to give but don't have cash, there is a QR code on the back side of the bulletin to do that. But I would also invite all of you, as the offering plates are passed out, to at least touch the offering plate as a way of offering yourself to God and to God's service this morning. So with that, let us offer and receive these gifts which God blesses us with. Now let us join together in the prayer of dedication as it is printed in the bulletin. Loving God, we thank you for this Easter day. 
with its promise of new life and new opportunities, we offer you ourselves and our gifts to love and to serve you as we engage in doing the healing works of the risen Christ. May these gifts reveal your presence to all creatures and creation. Amen. And now reading to you from the Gospel of Mark in the 16th chapter. Mark is the first, second book of the New Testament, but the first gospel to have been written. And the original chapter 16 is only eight verses long and was done so on purpose to make us think and to wonder about the gift that has been given on this day. And as we hear the story, know that Jesus, when he was crucified, was put in the tomb at the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath. And none of the women had known where or knew that he had not been anointed. So when they go, they go to do mundane but holy and sacred duty on that first morning. So let us listen and may God speak to us in the reading and the hearing of these words. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid.
So we come. We come on Easter morning. We come to hear the words that he is risen. And I always say, I, I, uh, I, I said, I, like, I love the Luke passage, but I also do love the Mark account of the resurrection. Love it because the women, the women are doing not the women's work. They're doing holy work. They're doing something in a period of mourning for friends, for someone that they knew and they followed. And they, they, they had a big task because their first concern was how is the stone going to be rolled away? But it was. And the story then says they, they walk in and they, they see this, this guy in white. He says, hey, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He ain't here. See? Not there. But he's gone to Galilee like he told you and Peter. Now here's the thing that I can't figure out in the whole thing. We know in the story of the Gospels that Peter's one of the disciples. Uh, I'm trying to figure out why he got special mention. But that's not the focus of the sermon. But it's just a nugget I've been living with all week. What is that special thing? But when Jesus, when the angel says, going ahead of you to Galilee, there you will see me. I've got to go back to just before, just before Peter was going to deny Jesus. Jesus said, after I've risen, go to Galilee and there you will see me. Mark's gospel does not give us an encounter with Jesus. And that can be hard for people because you have John's gospel lesson where Jesus is in, and I could have used that text, it would have worked, uses that Mary goes to the garden and she can't see and wants to know where they put the body of Jesus, and it says that Jesus was the one talking to her, but she supposed him to be the gardener. I chose the Luke text because in the Luke text, as I said earlier, the the disciples in that story are overcome with their grief. They don't know what to make of this message, and so they, they need to get out of town. They go, and they are joined by a person. Now, two things we need to understand, especially in this day and age where we're... We're taught, we're being conditioned to be afraid of people we don't know. Right? That's just how we're, we, we drill it into our kids, stranger danger. But this person joins Jesus, Jesus joins these two people on their walk. Now, first of all, we need to understand safety in numbers. A seven mile journey. Back then, uh, there was no Uber, no Lyft, uh, no rickshaw drivers, okay? It was by foot, and maybe they were going down some terrain that, where bandits could hide out. But they're talking, and they're talking about what had happened, and then it says when the disciples got to where they were going, it said Jesus was going ahead of them, and they urged him to stay with them because it was evening for the whole thing that I just mentioned. So they were showing radical hospitality, inviting this stranger in with them, but it says when he took the bread and he blessed it, they recognized the risen Christ. Yesterday, I got to fulfill a bucket list item. Two things, actually. First time to the TD Garden, ever. It's not like the old, oh, it's not like the old where the Celtics used to play. Thank God. <laughs> but, Got to go see a Final Eight game. My first ever NCAA tournament game. First time I've seen the UConn Husky men play in over 28 years. Just because I prefer the women's game to the guys' game. But these tickets were bought back in January before we knew it was going to happen. Parking yesterday, shall we say, was a bit of a challenge. 
and there were five of us, and we dropped other three people off, and then Janet and I parked someplace, and um, you need to know, I can navigate a car just about anywhere. Put me on foot and want to read a map, I am not your person, okay? I'm just not your person. We lucked out. I was wearing Yukon paraphernalia, and these young men, they're like, they saw us in the parking garage, and they're like, yeah! You know, and I was like, okay. I was like, um, I was like hey, let's follow them. I think they know where they're going. Sure enough, they did. And I, once I go somewhere, walk it, I remember it. But seeing Jesus yesterday happened numerous times. For in our walk from the parking garage just past Faneuil Hall to TD Garden, I saw a couple people. A couple people were just up against the cement wall, a sign out. Anything will help. I reached into my pocket and gave them what I, what I had. It wasn't much, but it was something. And the person behind me said, but what if they spend that on, and I was like, I hope they spend it on whatever. Well, why did you do that? I was like, well, I said, I'm a person of faith. I didn't say I was a Christian. I said, I'm a person of faith. And I said, in my faith tradition, there is a passage that Jesus says in Matthew. As you have done unto the least of these, you've also done unto me. And it was the ones who asked this question and said, Lord, when did we see you and visit you in prison? When did we see you and feed you? When did we see you and give you clothes? Throughout Lent, talked about the roles of Jesus, just to make sure I get them all. Talked about Jesus as friend, teacher, savior, way, Lord. And today is Jesus as presence. How do we as the people of the faith of the risen Christ recognize the presence of Jesus? How do we do that? And it's, it's an interesting exercise, and I, I know I joked earlier about the glasses, but uh, 20, 24 and a half years ago, I was being installed at my first church, and there was time between the morning service and the installation service, and we went, uh, a bunch of us went to an establishment, and there were other people that I knew that I said, hey, here's a place to grab lunch, whatnot, and we're sitting eating, and they said, hey, look, there's Alden and Ruth. And I'm like, where? And they're like, over there. And one of my friends who wears glasses said, Hink, try these. I was like, oh, yeah, they're there. Like, I totally would have missed them because my eyesight, mm. kids, it, it's awful to get old. Just know that, all right? But for us as followers, or even as skeptics, how do we recognize and how do we see the presence of the risen Christ, the reason why we're here to celebrate, yes, that God has done something wonderful, new and fresh and different. We know the story, but we may know it all too well and become too comfortable with it. Mark challenges us in his lesson that it says the women go in, they don't find what it is, but it says they're afraid. But it also says the angel said, go to Galilee. Jesus is in front of you. And perhaps that's one of the things we need to think about is that wherever we go, Jesus is already there in the Galilees of our lives. Whether that's at work, at school, on the mountains, on the basketball court, wherever we find ourselves, that Jesus is already there. The question is, are we open to seeing this risen Jesus in our presence? Part of my journey for Lent was to read a book by Diana Butler Bass, who inspired the sermon series, because she taught, it's a book called Free in Jesus. And she shared this quote from a theologian called Grace Soon Kim, who writes, the Christian faith is different from what the, world of the rest of the world teaches. The Christian faith is not 
Seeing is believing, but rather, believing is seeing. We must open our eyes and hearts and see Jesus' presence in our lives. We need to see him in the places that we dare not look and dare not think about. A friend of mine once said that doing the following of Jesus is getting your fingernails dirty, getting the grit and the grime under your fingernails. And if anyone knows me, that bothers me tremendously at the end of the day. Like, I will scrub incessantly, but I know, like, it's a good, honest day's work when your, your hands are dirty and that you've gotten there. But we need to look for Jesus in the places where we live our lives. And Diana Butler Bass was talking also about later on in this same book that she was talking to Phyllis Tickle, who, if you want a good read on anything, go read anything Phyllis Tickle wrote. The woman was wicked smat, okay? Um, and she could help, help you see things and frame things in a way that's different, but her and Diana Butler Bass were colleagues on a faculty and Diana Butler Bass had just had her first child and was kind of lamenting about not being able to do the writing and the teaching and going out and giving lectures. And Phyllis Tickle said to her, don't worry about it, you'll get back to that. But remember this, sometimes life takes place and faith takes place on a big stage, but most of the drama of the Christian faith is in smaller places. The trick is to pay attention, to cultivate awareness right here, right now. Diana Butler Bass said then she was given a book a couple weeks later by her friend it's called The Quotidian Mysteries, Laundry, Liturgy, and Woman's Work by another great author, Kathleen Norris, who I highly recommend. Butler Bass said she groaned because she thought of the label woman's work. But first she said, I had to look up the word quotidian. She goes, which means ordinary. Everyday tasks that may be mundane. But she's, again, she quotes now Norris, our daily tasks, whether we perceive them as drudgery or essential life-supporting work, have a considerable spiritual import and their significance for Christian theology, the way they come together in the fabric of faith, is not often appreciated. We come to celebrate the resurrection, this grand and glorious gesture by God to raise up Jesus from the dead, to give us a second chance and a second life, isn't something that just happens today, but it happens again in those nooks and crannies of everyday life. Whether it's doing the eighth load of laundry for the week, or preparing a big meal, or a little meal, or perhaps setting up for a bake sale, or an Easter egg hunt. Struggling to get through the day because, well, maybe one of us or some of us have an addiction to, and we can name anything as an addiction, you could name my NCAA basketball watching as an addiction. You could. And that's where we need to look and see Jesus. Jesus is already there in front of us because God has raised this man up so that we will not be alone. And part of why the world doesn't believe us is because we don't proclaim or show that faith in how we live. Imagine how different the world would be if they saw just in our daily presence, our daily presence, following the words of Jesus of showing grace and forgiveness love, compassion, empathy. And not because the person believes the same as we, looks the same as we, but because that's what we believe and that the actions in the life of Jesus Christ and his ministry, death, and resurrection is so compelling to us that we want to do things differently than the rest of the world. And it's in those everyday activities that people will see the presence of Christ if we allow that presence to show forth in us, to shine out, to be the light. The disciples who walked to Emmaus said they saw 
Jesus in the breaking of the bread. May we who are about to break bread together, may we see Jesus here with us now. May we see Jesus when we leave this place and go have brunch, dinner. May we see Jesus at the traffic stop in the crosswalk. May we see Jesus wherever we lay our head. And may we show this Jesus, this faith of God, to the world for the healing, the hope that this world needs and that we celebrate the good news and that we are the good news of the risen Christ today and forevermore. Would you join now in the invitation to communion as it is printed in the bulletin. On the first Easter, the angel told the women that Jesus would go ahead of them to Galilee. There, they, they were to go and tell the disciples that they would see Jesus there. Yes, but what about us? Where do we see Jesus? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. But Lord, sometimes we need to see to believe. Where can we see you? You will see me in the least of these. Lord, how will the world know? How will they see you? You will receive power from the Holy Spirit that has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your body, the church. What a wonderful task you have entrusted to us to embody you in the world. But we need your strength to do this. Our eyes need to be opened. How will we know you? You will know me in the breaking of the bread. I would invite you to help us sing the next hymn in the insert, I Come With Joy to Meet My Lord, and if you wish to rise in spirit or body, so you may do so. Please be seated.
Now let us join our hearts together in prayer. Eternal, empowering, holy God, we praise you for the promise and fresh energy the Easter story brings into our lives. On, to, on this Easter morn, we welcome you, O Jesus, into our lives. We welcome your resurrection, for it is life-changing, life-giving, and life-sustaining. We welcome the hope it brings to our world. We welcome the empty tomb, for we know that it means that you are on the loose. We are thankful that you, O oh Jesus, continue to show yourself to us in new ways and that we can experience your love, presence, and vision for this world in our own lives and times. Gracious God, we praise you and thank you for the witnesses of the women who went to the tomb. The scripture describes the fears as well as the joys and relief they experienced. We too are caught between the fears and doubts of our faith and the joy and affirmation of what we have seen and known. Jesus, may your resurrection give life to those who feel lifeless, to those who are just going through the motions, and those that have had the death of a loved one. Jesus, may your resurrection give hope to those who are mired in despair, who feel hopeless, and who have given up all hope. Jesus, may your resurrection give joy to those who feel no joy, who have lost their joy, or have had their joy snuffed out. We pause now in silence to offer you the words that weigh upon our hearts and our minds, and in which only you can hear. Gracious God, it is good to recognize ourselves as part of the history of your people, struggling between fear of what is and what has been, and a desire to affirm an open and unknown future. Unexpected, moving, evolving Spirit of God, you bring about powerful reversals in the world and in our lives. The mystery you created in this universe is a constant reminder of the ways you create and recreate through the cycles of death and new life, through change and fresh beginnings. As your Easter people, we want this new life to be offered and experienced by people and situations all over our world for hope to be known and embraced. May we on this Easter day continue to give thanks that you, O oh God, have set Jesus loose in this world and that your presence will be known to others in how we live this faith. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So the scripture from Luke tells us that Jesus, after traveling with these two disciples, and was invited, invited to stay and to share a meal, says that Jesus took bread and when he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to them that their eyes were open and they recognized the risen Christ in front of them. Jesus celebrated this same meal with his disciples on the night of his desertion, betrayal, and arrest. He was remembering with them a meal of freedom, a freedom of new life for the people of Israel to no longer be slaves in Egypt. And so when he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, he did something new and different as a reminder that faith is fresh. And so then, in that same night when they were celebrating that meal, he took what was called the second cup of the evening, and he poured wine into a cup, and he said, this is the cup 
of salvation for the forgiveness of all sin. And as often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. We come to receive this bread and this juice that we may be fed and nourished on our journey to meet the risen Christ in the places where we live and that we may see this Christ before us here and now as the host of this sacred and beautiful table where all are invited to receive and to participate. No testimony of faith, no test is required other than you want to know and taste that God is good and to be nurtured for the journey that awaits you. Would you join with me in prayer? Gracious God, may you send your Holy Spirit upon these simple gifts of bread and of juice that all who receive may be nourished and that our eyes may be opened to see you in each person who is here and in each person we will encounter when we leave your sacred space and go out into the sacred space of your creation to greet others who are made in your holy image. Remind us that we are not fed by our own hand, but by the graciousness of your hand, by those who have planted, perhaps, the migrant, by those who have transported, perhaps, the union worker, that we have, meal has been prepared by hands that we do not know, but that we receive from your bounty each and every day and are connected to all people and are called to end the divisions, the barriers, and to lift up all people in love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning we will celebrate uh, communion. And as you heard me say, this table is open to all, to the youngest, to whoever holds the title of not being the youngest, to whatever you might believe about God, to whatever you might not believe about God. Jesus welcomed all people to eat with him. And so you are welcome to receive bread and juice. We will invite you to come down the center aisle to receive a piece of bread to our younger people who are here. All the bread is cut the same. No one piece is bigger than the other. The first piece of bread you touch is yours. Same with the juice. I invite you to return to your seats, the side aisle. If you wish to receive the bread and the juice when you get back to your seat, you may do so. Or if you wish to wait till everyone's been served, you may do so. There is no right, there is no wrong. There's just tasting and eating Jesus. So now ministering to you in the name of the risen Christ, we give you this bread and this cup. Come, for all things are ready.
if you haven't done so already, receive the bread of life broken for you. And if you haven't done so already, receive the cup of blessing poured out for you. And let us close now in the prayer of thanksgiving as it is printed. Bountiful and gracious God, we give thanks that you have refreshed us at your table, where we have tasted your nourishing and nurturing presence revealed in the risen Christ. We have rested in the depth of your love and accepted you into our bodies and into our lives. Now strengthen our faith, increase our love for all people, and send us forth into the world to be your presence of hope, love, grace, and forgiveness. Amen. Before I offer the blessing, just to know that, uh, again, after worship, there are some baked sale items out in this foyer here. So please uh, make sure you don't go to brunch or dinner empty-handed. And to thank you for being here this morning. And I hope that you continue to be the presence of God's love, be the presence of the witness of the resurrection to the people you encounter that you let the presence of the Holy Spirit guide you, lead you, and continue to teach you on this odd and wondrous journey, and that you go into the Galilees of your lives, knowing that Jesus is with you. Now go forth in the name of the risen Christ, knowing that he walks ahead of you, next to you, and behind you, lifting you always in love, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Happy Easter to you all. Good morning, everyone. The closing song is not just something for the choir to sing. You get to join us. So if you are able, on your feet would be lovely. The words are really complicated. Are you listening very hard right now? The words are halle, halle, hallelujah. Do you think you can handle it? Rise up. The choir will sing it for you once, and then on repeat, we'll sing it together. <laughs> <laughs>